anyone who has anxiety, depression, OCD, bipolar, virtually any mental illness you can think of, can readily be influenced or directly caused by mold toxicity, environmental toxicities, biochemical perturbations, which are triggered by that. You mentioned hormonal imbalance, which plays a huge role there. Both mold and Lyme inflame the pituitary gland and affect the way that the body can regulate its hormones. Welcome to the Mind Health 360 show. I'm Kirkland Newman, and if you or your loved ones suffer from mental health issues such as depression, anxiety, insomnia, poor memory, poor attention, mood swings, exhaustion, stress, etc., I interview the leading integrative mental health experts from around the world to help you understand the root causes of these symptoms, many of which may surprise you and suggest solutions to help you heal over the long term. If you want further information, please go to www.mindhealth360.com or find us on social media. Okay, so Dr. Neil Nathan, you've been practicing medicine for over 47 years. You're board certified in family practice and pain management, and you're a founding diplomat of the American Board of Integrative Holistic Medicine and a board member of the International Society of Environmentally Acquired Illness. Your specialty is working with patients who have not received a diagnosis from conventional medical sources, and especially with patients whose illness has made them unusually sensitive and toxic, hence difficult to treat. Your book, Toxic, Heal Your Body from Mold Toxicity, Lyme Disease, Multiple Chemical Sensitivities, and Chronic Environmental Illness, which I have to say is utterly brilliant, riveting, beautifully written, incredibly comprehensive, and just, I mean, a must read and a real page turner. It's your most recent book, and it was written from your vast experience with such patients to help those suffering without a diagnosis and help them find their way towards health. You've lectured uh, to medical audiences nationally and internationally, and you've written several books prior to that. One of them is called Healing is Possible, New Hope for Chronic Fatigue, Fibromyalgia, Persistent Pain, and Other Chronic Illness, On Hope and Healing for Those Who've Fallen Through the Medical Cracks and Mold and Mycotoxins, Current Evaluation and Treatment. You've hosted an internationally syndicated radio program podcast on Voice America called The Cutting Edge of Health and Wellness Today. You also research and have published several papers, the most important being Metabolic Features of Chronic Fatigue Syndrome with Dr. Robert Navio. Your medical practice is based in Redwood. It's called the Redwood Valley Clinic, and it's in Northern California. And you can be contacted through your website, which is neilnathanmd.com. So I hope I haven't rushed too quickly through that, but you have an incredible amount of experience and just a vast array of amazing wealth to bring to the table. And I'm very grateful that you're here for Mind Health 360, which is a website which aims to raise awareness amongst lay people, their friends, families, and health practitioners about integrative mental health and functional medicine psychiatry and look at the root cause of help people look at the root cause of their mental illness and mainly common mental illness such as depression anxiety insomnia poor memory poor attention mood swings etc and look at all the factors from the biochemical factors such as toxicity gut hormones inflammation infections to the psycho-spiritual factors such as trauma difficult life circumstances stress to the lifestyle behavioral factors such as lack of sleep poor exercise lack of nature and natural light poor lifestyle habits So the website aims to really promote the idea that to heal mental health issues sustainably, which are currently pretty epidemic in our societies, we need to look at all the factors that are impacting these and not just treat the symptoms, usually with you know, pharmacological treatments, which is the current sort of way to go in mainstream medical practice. If you're lucky, you get a bit of CBT, a bit of therapy, but usually you get psych meds. And I think we're all in agreement that in order to really sustainably get to the root cause of mental illness, we have to look at all the factors that impact it, which are usually physical, a sort of combination of physical lifestyle and psycho-spiritual. So I'm really excited about your book because I think, you know, there are probably very few of our listeners, at least in the UK where I'm based, 
who think, you know, if you go to a psychiatrist and you're put on antidepressants for anxiety or for depression or for insomnia, that this could have anything to do with your toxic load, that it could have something to do with being exposed to mold or being infected by Lyme disease. And yet what your book really does is it, first of all, is an absolute must read, but also puts into relief the fact that a lot of these symptoms are linked to chronic inflammation, which is caused by exposure to mold toxins and other toxins, and also infections. And so what I'd like to do is just, if you can talk us through a little bit how this works, you know, how do mold and environmental toxins cause inflammation, which then leads to mental health symptoms? How do Lyme and other infections cause inflammation, which then can lead to mental health symptoms? And also, how does that inflammation impact our brains and our moods, you know, and, and what part of the brain, etc.? depression, anxiety, mood swings, insomnia, neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. So I don't want to throw too much at you right now, and I hope I haven't overwhelmed you with those questions, but would love to hear your take on that. Well, that's a lot to cover. <laughs> Maybe um, I should break it down. So that, I, 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 thought, I thought I'd start by breaking it down. So uh, I think, first of all, mental health, does require this holistic integrative overview because as you've said the current way of practicing mental health from psychiatry is simply to give a uh, psychiatric medication and back when those medications first came into vogue i know that the psychiatric profession fell in love with them it was like, ah, yes, great. Now we'll be able to get that serotonin balance. Now we'll be able to get that those neurotransmitters back into balance merely by giving you a pill. The problem, as you know, is that it isn't that we have a level of serotonin in our body. Different areas of the brain have different amounts of serotonin and metabolize all of the neurotransmitters differently. So it is not that we're hitting a single area that we can do with precision. It's kind of like trying to blanket the brain with serotonin by using medication that promotes that. And as you also know, that hasn't really worked very well. We can help some people sometimes with these medications, but our lack of precision doesn't really allow us to get at the problem in a way that is universally helpful for all of those patients. Yeah. And there are some psychiatrists beginning and growing who are beginning to realize, I think we're coming at it from the wrong angle. We need to go back to basics and go, okay, what is causing this? So you mentioned several causes that I think we can talk about separately. First, inflammation, number one. We're learning that almost all chronic illness is caused by inflammation. And then we have to ask the question, what's causing that inflammation? Because again, if we get simplistic about it, if we go, ah, I'll take an anti-inflammatory medication and that will remove my inflammation. Well, actually, to most of an extent, it won't, because we still aren't dealing with cause. So you're absolutely right. What we have to be doing for every patient, regardless of what their illness is, is we've got to find the root cause and treat it with the kind of precision we can bring to the table. So with mental illness, inflammation is a biggie. Inflammation can be caused by toxins, the most common of which is probably mold heavy metal toxicity, particularly lead and mercury, and our environment is filled with toxins. Here in the States, there are 80,000 chemicals that are currently in use. Of those 80,000 chemicals, perhaps 500 have actually been tested for their effects in human beings. And almost no one has done any testing on how these chemicals interact with each other in the same way. So we have added, in the last 50 years, we have added 70,000 chemicals to our environment about which we know virtually nothing. 
and we have not done this with any degree of consciousness whatsoever. So we are living in an inflamed world right now. Not to mention the EMFs and the electric pollution as well, the electromagnetic right. pollution. Right. Yep. That was my next sentence. <laughs> Sorry. Um, the, <laughs> that's okay. Uh, and, and yes, to mention that, because 80 years ago, we didn't have these waves. The amount of electromagnetic pollution currently is extraordinary and we are only beginning to look at it as something that is also affecting inflammation in our brains. It's even thought that people ask the question, I'm supposed to be a mold expert and one of the questions I get asked all the time is, now there's been mold on this planet forever. It preceded our existence on the planet. In fact, mold toxicity is described in the Old Testament, in Leviticus. So this is not a new thing. But having practiced medicine for 47 plus years, I never saw mold toxicity the way I am now until the last 20, 25 years. Where did this come from? Why do we have it now? Again, Dr. Klinghart, who's quite prominent in this field, has postulated that the EMFs that we are all being exposed to have annoyed the mold and essentially made them more toxic. Now, this is very easy to understand because molds don't make toxin unless they feel threatened. And if they feel threatened by EMF, they are literally being stimulated to make more toxins than they ever would have in another environment. So we can come back and talk with that, but let me come back to the overall larger question. So given inflammation, and again, inflammation from toxins, inflammations from infections, one of the most common infections which gets very little press is Lyme disease. And I know that there are areas of Europe, for example, in which physicians are being told, we don't have Lyme disease. Mm -hmm. And in fact, there are areas of this country where infectious disease specialists are under the impression that we don't have Lyme disease. Our CDC, back in 2013, acknowledged for the first time that we had 300,000 new cases of Lyme disease every year an epidemic far greater than HIV ever was. Last year, they raised that number to 400,000 new cases of Lyme disease every year. So in our country where some people are still being told we don't have it, I can assure you that you've got it in the UK. It is present in every country, every continent on this planet. And it's going unrecognized because people deny that it is present. And it's interesting, the whole Lyme disease thing, because it's linked to climate change. I read an article recently that was talking about how climate change is actually enhancing the presence of, you know, it's, it's making our world more hospitable to ticks and, you know, ticks tick-borne disease, of which Lyme disease is one, is therefore spreading a lot faster because of climate change and the fact that there are more ticks and that there's more, and presumably also our immunity to these tick bites and to getting these infections is lowered due to our general state of inflammation. It's interesting, you talk about why mold is more of an issue now and one of the reasons maybe being EMFs, but also I think, you know, if you look at our modern diet, if our, our modern stress levels are the, the state of our gut with antibiotics and NSAIDs and our whole systems are more fragilized both on the inside and also on the outside in terms of all the pollutants and chemicals, etc. And therefore, we're more susceptible to, you know, our immune systems are less strong. I mean, that was just an aside regarding Lyme. Yeah. Well, again, we're trying to first start with an overview here, yes. and I'm trying to um, suggest that there is much more of this than people have been led to believe, and many people who are suffering with all kinds of symptoms. I mean, uh, Lyme disease 
and some of the co-infections, such as Bartonella. And by the way, they're not just carried by ticks. They're also spread by mosquitoes, by biting flies. Bartonella is spread by fleas. So many, many biting insects will carry these infections. And again, that goes a bit unrecognized. In the States, we estimate that there are 10 million patients who have mold toxicity at this time with varying degrees of symptoms. Wow. And I know that in the, UK, in the UK, which is at least as damp and has buildings that are quite a bit older than ours, having quite a few patients in the UK, I know that mold is a serious issue there, which basically goes unrecognized. Okay. So these are these are these are very big things in the mental health area. I, I I don't think that people often think of mold, for example, as being more allergic. So you might get asthma or eczema or um, sinus issues from mold. That's true. That's allergy. But mold toxicity is another critter, indeed. Mold toxin causes brain inflammation, particularly, and you ask this in your run-on sentence, original start, particularly it inflames certain parts of the brain that affect mental health, most notably the limbic system, which is the part of the brain that controls emotion, sensitivity, cognition, energy, and pain. And the what we call the polyvagal area, the vagus nerve and the associated cranial nerves. Now, these two parts of the brain are anatomically separate, but they communicate with each other very, very closely because they both work together to help a being understand their level of safety. Safety is the issue, particularly with the vagus nerve and limbic system. And if a being is under threat by infection or toxin or their environment. For example, multiple chemical sensitivities is an extremely common component of mold toxicity. In, in my experience, virtually everyone who has chemical sensitivities has mold as their primary cause. They may also have Lyme. They may also have Bartonella. So anyone who has anxiety, depression, OCD, bipolar, virtually any mental illness you can think of can readily be influenced or directly caused by mold toxicity, environmental toxicities, biochemical perturbations, which are triggered by that. You mentioned hormonal imbalance, which plays a huge role there. Both mold and Lyme inflame the pituitary gland and affect the way that the body can regulate its hormones. So we're talking about a very complicated toxic effect, which really must be understood by all practitioners when you're dealing with anybody who has, honestly, almost any symptom could be related to that. But particularly in the mental health field, all mental health practitioners need to be aware of mold toxicity and Lyme disease as primary issues. If you're not, you're going to miss how to help those people get well. And you can give them an SSRI until the cows come home. It will not cure them. It's really complicated, though, because, you know, I, I, it's uh, what, what interests me about mold and Lyme is the sort of downstream effect that they have on all the other bodily systems. And one of the things in your book that you cover beautifully is the rebooting of all the different systems that needs to happen. And, you know, it's almost like an octopus with its tentacles, you know, so you have the, the original cause could be mold or other toxicity or infections such as Lyme, but then it has such an impact on all the systems in your body from the hormone system to your nervous system, to your gut, to your detoxification pathways, to your stress levels. And one of the things you talk about is this sort of cell danger response where it seems to me that what happens is, you know, the body uh, is so used to being inflamed by this mold and, and Lyme, etc., that the even if you then remove 
remove the mold and remove and treat the Lyme, what happens is it's like the on switch is there and this, this inflammation becomes chronic. And then only by then rebooting the various systems that have been impacted by these issues are you then going to heal sustainably. So it's quite complex because essentially you show really well all the different parts and, and bodily systems that are impacted by this. But how do you as a practitioner go in there and figure out, okay, which parts have been impacted? And then how do you fix each of those parts? Because, you know, from the gut to your hormones, to your detoxification, to your immune system, to your methylation, etc. How do you piece that sort of puzzle together? I mean, it's like being a medical detective so that you can then, you know, and again, I mean, I've, I've talked about too many things here, but maybe you can break that down for us. Sure. Yeah. You see, I think that all doctors should be curious about why is this being who is in front of me suffering? Why are they sick? What is making them sick? And unfortunately, that used to be what we did in medicine. I am old enough that I grew up in what was called the golden age of medicine, where we were allowed to do what we wanted with patients. And if we wanted to order a test, we ordered a test. Insurance companies paid for it. Our judgment was respected. And then, at least in the States, and I know you've got socialized medicine, we shifted into a different kind of reimbursement in which the physician kind of got booted out of the equation. We became providers. That was the name we were called rather than physicians. And it got to the point that in many, many clinics in our country, physicians are given seven minutes per patient per visit. And you can't get to the bottom of anything in that period of time. You can barely talk to someone, find out their main complaint, attempt to deal with it, and move on to the next patient, which is, goes under the rubric productivity in our country. But that's not productive at all. That is a cursory examination. It's a superficial interaction. You can never get to the bottom of anything. And our physicians are so overworked and burnt out at this particular point that the idea of being curious about what someone has is gone. So what I do is what doctors should be doing, which is taking the time to talk to someone and understand what they've got going on. Now, to answer your question, the way I figure out what system needs to be rebooted is I just listen. And I do take the time to do that. My shortest visit with any patient is 30 minutes. My new patient evaluation is two hours. And I'm, what I'm doing is I'm listening. They will tell me where they hurt and how. And I will ask as many detailed questions as I can. Go, is your gut involved? To what extent? What are your symptoms? What are your symptoms of how your brain is working? Are you anxious? Are you depressed? What sets that off? What stresses are you living under? How is your brain working? What can it do? What can't it do? How are your hormones? So I can pretty much put together by simply history, which is the standard skeleton of any basic medical evaluation. With history, I can pretty much begin to hone in on where are these problems? Uh, is there a hormonal problem? Then I'm going to need to order some tests, measure that, figure out what they are. In the mental health world, for example, when someone complains of things like anxiety or depression, I'm going to be looking at copper and zinc levels and comparing the ratio of those things. I'm going to be looking at methylation chemistry and seeing what that's doing. I'm going to look at something called paroles or crypto paroles so that these are biochemical perturbations that are easily measured and often fixing those will have a huge role in helping those patients to start feeling better using natural materials. No drugs because that's getting at the heart of the biochemical pathways that are triggering all of this. So the first part of your question was, 
how do I go about doing it? And the answer is like the old fashioned ways, taking a good history, listening, and then ordering tests that help me refine that and be as precise as I can about giving patients what they need. And then presumably, a lot of the time, there's a combination of factors. So you can have, for instance, you know, you can have a sort of an adrenal dysregulation with high cortisol due to chronic stress, which then throws out of whack your sex hormones, which then can cause leaky gut over time and sort of inflammation in the gut because of the the sort of wearing down of the tight junctions. You know, so nothing goes, nothing is on its own, essentially. You have to look at all these different symptoms together. And then I'm always curious, though, how do you sort of narrow down where the main source of the problem is coming from? I mean, is it toxicity or is it a hormone imbalance caused by chronic stress? Or is it, you know, maybe just a food intolerance, which rather than being a symptom could be actually a cause? So that's what I'm always curious about, how you piece that together. What is the, what is the root cause, you know, versus the secondary effects? So I'll give you two answers to that question, all right? The first is a left brain answer, and then I'm going to give you a right brain answer. The left brain answer is there are specific descriptions that patients give me that narrow down what's causing it as a root cause. Mm. For example, in the mold world, if someone were to tell to me, you know, doctor, I've got this odd vibration in my body, it's not visible externally, it's not a tremor. But I feel this vibration often in my spine or in certain parts of my body. The only things I've ever seen that will cause that are mold and Bartonella. If someone describes electrical shock sensations or an ice pick like pain, that's mold or Bartonella or Lyme. All right. If someone describes psychologically helpless, hopelessness or despair, or they describe uh, depersonalization or derealization. Those are often mold or Bartonella, as an example. The, especially when they tell me that this anxiety comes out of the blue. It's not that they're experiencing a company's audit or that they've got an in-law coming over that they have a difficult interaction with that's making them upset or worried. They're just having a perfectly okay day and then bam, all of a sudden they're anxious. I call that a, a physical anxiety and it's typically caused by these kinds of toxins with fluctuating amounts of toxin being prostate, processed by their bodies and how they work with it. If someone comes to me with the language atypical in a diagnosis that another physician has made, atypical Alzheimer's, atypical MS, atypical Parkinson's, atypical rheumatoid arthritis. If I hear the word atypical, I'm thinking infection or toxin as a cause because it already means this is not fitting into that conventional medical way of, of looking at it. If someone describes numbness and tingling in parts of the body that are not parts of the body that typically get those, tip of the nose, the belly, the back, as opposed to in the fingertips or the toes, we call that an atypical paresthesia. That's the fancy language for it. Now I'm thinking a toxin or infectious cause. So these descriptions that I get, again, I'm talking left brain. This is simply, I'm hearing this and I'm going, ah, I, I think I understand what you have. These are the very same symptoms that if a physician has never heard of these diagnoses is likely to say, oh, that's crazy. You can't possibly have that symptom. You need to see a, a psychiatrist because I can't help you. And so we add not being heard or understood by physicians as adding another level of stress. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm going to shift. I'm going to go out on a little bit on a limb here now. Right brain. I've been doing this for a very long time. And I have been training my intuition as best I can to pick up on the energy of certain illnesses. 
So if you will, I have treated so many patients with so many unusual illnesses that literally there's an energetic vibe I, maybe that's not even the right word, an energetic perception that when I'm with someone, I can feel what they're describing, and I go, ah, that's a mold description. That's a Bartonella description. For example, the way someone describes um, certain symptoms in Bartonella, patients have a very, very intense, vivid way of describing it. And they'll point, they'll go, it feels like things are crawling around in my brain and it burns in my frontal lobes. That's Bartonella. And I think that all physicians do this, but we don't talk about it very much, that once you've had a fair amount of experience, you can literally feel what someone has by the way they are presenting, the tone of their voice, how they're talking about it. And so, again, that's another piece of it that I think needs to be talked about uh, more by medical people because I think we all do it. Yes, and thank goodness you guys do it because I think, you know, that's what you rely on in a good physician. So that's fascinating because, I mean, essentially – it's really about establishing almost a hierarchy of causes, so what the root cause is and then what the downstream effects are. And so you sort of proceed by the symptoms, the, the biochemical tests, which can be done, and then also your intuition to get a full picture. And then talk us through a little bit about the fact that, you know, a lot of your patients, what happens is that they've been triggered, essentially, by the mold toxicity or the Lyme infection or the Bartonella or whatever it happens to be. And then their inflammation is sort of on. And it's very hard to then get that off, even when the root cause is addressed. So you get rid of the mold, you treat the Lyme or the Bartonella, and yet they still have symptoms because, you know, a lot of their systems have been triggered essentially by this. And so that's where in your book you talk about rebooting all these different systems. So if you can talk to us a little bit about the mechanisms of that, where, you know, people can go on still having these symptoms despite having treated the root cause. How do you deal with that? And then what do you do about it essentially? Okay. So that gives me an opportunity to talk about the cell danger response. Yes. The cell danger response is a model created by the brilliant physician Bob Navio. He's a professor at UC San Diego of genetics and pediatrics. And Bob has been working on this for many, many years. He published in 2013 his model of chronic illness. And he calls that model the cell danger response. And I'll try to make something complicated simple here. Basically, on a cellular level, when, when a cell is exposed to a threat, and that can be a toxin or an infection, the mitochondria, which are the energy-creating little organelles inside every cell, are the first part of that cell to react. And basically what they do is they push the cell and then the whole body into this cell danger response. Basically it's er, 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 danger. And then the cell goes through this primitive, millennia old way of biochemically trying to deal with this threat. The cell walls itself off, it protects itself it essentially attempts to commit harry-carry by allowing itself to die to prevent the spread of that infection or toxin through the body. It sends out messenger signals to the whole body going, we're in danger, shut down, take care. Now, in the throes of an illness, again, be it a toxic experience or an infection, that's a protective mechanism. It's intended to be short-lived. So let's take a virus, for example. Um, a virus enters the cell, the cell freaks out, it goes shut down, I'm going to take care of this. Now, for most viruses, the virus will go away, oh, in 10 days, and maybe it's a cold, maybe it's a little bit worse than that. And then it will send an all clear message. We're safe, we're fine, everybody back to your places, we're good. But in these 
prolonged infections like Lyme, mold toxicity, heavy metal toxicity, where there's a constant ongoing threat, that message doesn't stop coming by. It's like your alarm in your house goes off and you can't figure out how to turn it off. You've got this awful piercing sound and you just can't turn it off. That's what the cell danger response is. So eventually, you may actually get rid of the toxin or take care of the infection. But if for some reason the mitochondria haven't quite got that, the body still thinks it's under threat and it will keep reacting in an inflamed way to that threat. And that's what we're dealing with. So at that point, we have to reboot those systems. It's almost like the cell has forgotten how to reboot itself. It doesn't know. It's and not so, automatic. And the symptoms with are, are the same as before then. So the mental health systems symptoms. So you could still be getting anxiety and depression, even though the root cause has been addressed. But the, the body still thinks it's under such threat that you, you're still suffering from the same system, symptoms. That's exactly right. And so the, the, the parts of the brain that I talked about before, the limbic system and the vagus nerve, are still under the impression that it's not safe in there. Right. And so they're going to protect you. They're going to stay hyper vigilant to protect you from whatever threat's going on. And until we can convince your nervous system, not your mind, mm -hmm. your nervous system, that the threat is gone, it's going to stay on, on hyper vigilant alert which is a protective originally, but after a while it becomes like an overprotective parent, which is not so helpful. It's quite interesting because if you look at the whole nervous system in mental health, there's a growing body of, of belief, and I certainly share this belief, that a lot of mental health issues are the result of a dysfunctional nervous system or a nervous system that's out of balance, that it's essentially overreacting to a threat, mm -hmm. or it's reacting to a threat that was in the past that hasn't been completed. And so what's really fascinating about what you're telling me is that, you know, we think of threats to the nervous system as psychological trauma or abuse or, or life events that have been traumatic that, that can then dysregulate the nervous system. But what you're saying is that biochemical, physical, physiological um, threats to the nervous system are interpreted by the body and by the nervous system in the same way. So, you know, if it's exposure to a mold toxin or an infection, the nervous system will respond in the same way as if it was, you know, childhood abuse. Or am I understanding that correctly? That essentially, yeah. whether it's a physiological or a psychological threat, it will dysregulate the nervous system, therefore causing mental health issues. You are understanding it correctly. That's exactly correct. And so the whole way of understanding this, and it works both ways, by the way. For people who have had a difficult childhood with various forms of abuse and trauma um, or physical trauma to their body, been hit by a car or, or had a number of surgical procedures done for a variety of reasons, many of them totally legitimate. For whatever reason, if that nervous system takes it as a form of threat, that I've got to be more careful, I've got to be more vigilant, those people we know are much more prone to getting mold and Lyme and infectious diseases later. They're at risk. We've always known that. People with chronic pain, for example, if they have a history of abuse or trauma in the early part of their life, their system is much more likely to be injured and to have trouble healing from that injury because of that. So dealing with those old traumas, and I'll use the word rebooting again, you literally have to reboot the nervous system to convince it that the world is safer than you thought. It's really not trying to hurt you. Yeah. It's really trying to protect you. It's going, you've had a tough life. I'm here to protect you. And I'm going to monitor your environment. In fact, I'm going to scrutinize your environment. So anything that even looks like a threat, I'm going to not let you do that. And, and that's a problem because eventually you aren't going to do anything. 
you're going to be living in this body that is on constant vigilant hyper alert and that body can't do much you're going to be basically living in fear and that in itself presumably will then physiologically cause inflammation so a physical response of you know high cortisol chronically high cortisol inflammatory cytokines which will then have a knock on effect on the physiology so it's like a vicious circle essentially so i think that's why your reboot analogy is so important and so valid because you have to break that vicious circle by rebooting the various systems so can you talk us through a little bit about about this rebooting of all the different systems that you talk about in order to, you know, reestablish homeostasis or balance in the body because the body knows how to heal itself. But what you're saying is that you need to sort of take it offline, reboot it so that it can then heal itself. Is is that it? Talk talk us through yep. the rebooting concept. Right. For those people who know me, my use of the reboot concept is amusing because I'm I'm technologically um, hampered. However, I, I, one of the few things I do know how to do is when my computer stops working, I shut it down, it starts back up again, and it works again. The only thing I know what to do, there are people who are much more computer literate than I am who can look at the issue and go, oh, I'll just go in here and do this and that. I can't. I just have to reboot it. So, the analogy, by the way, is I think absolutely correct, meaning that is what we're doing here. Um, the body has forgotten how to reboot itself. So let's take a variety of issues to talk about that with. Let's take the nervous system, which is prime here. Rebooting the limbic system has proven to be absolutely crucial in helping patients with a variety of issues, specifically those who have developed sensitivities to light, sound, touch, chemicals, food, and EMF, a sensitivity almost always implies that the limbic system is involved. So does emotional upheaval, anxiety, OCD, depression. So if you combine those, if a patient tells me you have both of those, I know that you've got limbic involvement here. And so there are several wonderful ways to reboot the limbic system. The ones that I use the most are the one developed by uh, a woman named Annie Hopper, whose program is called DNRS, Dynamic Neural Retraining Systems. And there's another system developed by Asha Gupta called Amygdala Retraining. And they're both, they have their differences, but both of them are focused on how to actually reboot the limbic system. And the bottom line is they really work. In other words, I've had at least 300 patients plus do the Annie Harper program, and usually within four to six weeks, they're telling me that they are less anxious, less sensitive, their brain is working better, they have less pain, and their energy is better just doing that. We haven't necessarily addressed root cause we still have to get the root cause out. If that's being triggered by mold or Lyme, we've got to treat that. But we can help our patients be much more comfortable by getting rebooting alone. For the vagus nerve, which connects to that very, very directly, I'll give you five or six rebooting strategies. One, uh, the simplest uh, is that there's a wonderful book written by a fellow named Stanley Rosenberg, called accessing the healing power of the vagus nerve mm. and at the back at the back of that book there are seven very simple exercises that can quiet the vagus nerve and the cranial nerves connected to it now rosenberg who practiced in denmark was a craniosacral practitioner so if you add osteopathic cranial work to that exercise program, it's a wonderful way to quiet the vagus nerve and to quiet many of the things going on inside the brain. And the vagus nerve is the longest nerve in the body and it links the brain and the gut and it is the seat of our sort of autonomic nervous system and regulates both our parasympathetic and our sympathetic. And I've heard, I don't know if this is in Rosenberg's book, but that things like gargling, singing, there are many different ways to tone yeah. that vagus nerve. I don't, is that are those the exercises that you're referring to? 
They were. I used to call them the Karazian exercises. Dadis Karazian, I'll spell it for your listeners. It's D A T I S K H A R R A Z I A N. Right. He's a, he's a fellow who wrote, he has a beautiful YouTube video that they can look at called The Gut Brain Axis. Uh-huh. in which he talks about the connection between the gut and the brain. It's beautifully done. It's got to be 10, 15 years old now. And in it, he talked about singing, gargling, and gagging as ways of rebooting the vagus nerve. Now, we've come a ways since then. So I used to use those exercises regularly with my patients in what I will call the old days. But um, the ones that I'm giving you now are much more specific to doing this more directly. Okay. So there's a device, in addition to osteopathic cranial work, in addition to these exercises that Stanley Rosenberg put forth, there's a device called Brain Tap, T-A-P, which it looks a bit like a virtual reality headset with earplugs. And it delivers different frequencies of light and sound simultaneously to the eyes and ears that reboot the inflamed parts of the brain based on the most recent research in neuroplasticity. A wonderful device. A lot of my patients get great benefit from it. There's another treatment device called frequency-specific microcurrent. Listeners can go to frequencyspecific.com as a website to maybe find practitioners near you. And you can specifically boot, reboot areas of the brain that have been affected by trauma. And you can specifically reboot the vagus nerve directly by using very, very gentle electrical stimulation. So gentle that most people can't even feel it. Interesting. Okay. And this does this reduce inflammation in those parts of the brain and the nerves? It, it does. Mm-hmm. It does. Okay. Fairly rapidly. Which so improves these are, conductivity between the nerves, presumably. Correct. Yeah. Or, and we're not sure which, it stimulates the nerves to find new pathways to accomplish the same goal. Ah, okay. Yeah. So I used to think that it was purely removing inflammation from the pathway so that the pathway would reboot itself. I now think that both occur because I, as we're learning about the nervous system and how it works, what we're learning is you can persuade neurons to accomplish a task by simply rehooking up in a slightly different way. Interesting. And I this is slightly off topic, but in terms of the nervous system and the connectivity and inflammation, I think inflammation makes it harder for nerves to connect successfully. And the other thing is, what about the myelinating sheath? And so the fats, the phospholipids in the diet, I mean, that's a whole nother part, which I think you address very in detail in your book as well about how to reduce inflammation and improve neural connectivity through using phospholipids, either intravenously or through your diet. Maybe yeah, that's, correct. Yeah. I mean, that, that, now we're taking on a whole yeah, new subject yeah. here. Sorry. Now we're more, we're more in the category of how to rebuild the membranes so that they can heal. And yes, I love intravenous phosphatidylcholine. You can't get the same effect orally, but it can be helpful to do so. And again, now we get into detoxification strategies, which is how do we get toxins out of the body, which are literally, if you could take an electrophotomicrograph, the toxins that are often literally gumming up the membranes, you can actually see that, that it's not just a concept, that you can actually see You can take pictures of these membranes after you detoxify and get rid of these toxins, and you can see a change in the membrane shape. So immediate, I mean, we're we're talking about immediately changing this using nutritional strategies, working with the liver, working with the gallbladder, working with the skin by sweating, working with the lungs, working with the kidneys, working with the gut. All of these are our major organs of detoxification. And by stimulating them, I left out the lymph system, um, lymphatic massage. All of these things are ways in which we can directly impact our ability to detoxify and move forward. 
Because that was going to be a question of mine. I mean, you know, if you've had mold toxicity, I mean, how do you get rid of it? And, you know, it seems from your book that it's incredibly complex. You have to use certain binders according to which type of mold it is. And then you have to reboot all the systems accordingly and, you know, optimize your detoxification systems through various supplements. And it can be a bit overwhelming. But if you can you know, maybe that's because I'm a lay person, but if you can sort of talk us through what would be your step-by-step detoxification approach if you do have mold toxicity, for instance. Sure. Maybe I've been doing it so long that it's not, I don't think it's that complicated, but my definition of complicated and others might differ. So I will, I will take that with a grain of salt. For me, it's straightforward. If you think you have mold toxicity, you start by getting a urine mycotoxin test, which is simply you collect your urine and you see what's in the urine. It's a very straight measurement. If you have a lot of toxins in your urine, you have mold toxicity. This is not rocket science. And we will measure which toxins are in the urine. So knowing which toxins, we we now know which binders will specifically pull those out. So the most common toxin, for example, mold toxin, is okra toxin. And the best binders for okra toxin are activated charcoal and a medication, uh, either cholesteramine or another one called cholesevarin. Those are the main ones that physicians can prescribe. And taking them in the correct doses, this where it gets a little tricky, but in the right doses, that will pull it out of the body over time. So I don't think that's complicated. You figure out what's there, and you take the right binder to treat it with. The tricky part is you have to go at a dosage that your patient can handle, meaning it, because it sounds simple, some physicians go, okay, I'll just take all the charcoal that you can possibly imagine. And unfortunately, if you take too high a dose of binder – it will actually mobilize toxin faster than that person can process it and will actually make them more toxic and worse. So if whatever they're taking is making them worse, we're going at it the wrong way. We need to cut back. We need to, we need to find a dose, and it can be tiny. A very, very tiny dose of binder is often extremely effective in getting the toxins out. This is one of those things where if some is good, more is not necessarily better. Got to be careful with dose. But if you are, it's fairly straightforward in getting it out of the body. With one more wrinkle, which is most of the people who get mold toxicity have colonized, meaning their exposure to mold has been long enough that the mold is now growing in their sinus or gut areas. And we now have to give them antifungal nasal sprays an oral treatment to get it out of there so it can stop making the toxin ongoing. So those are the three main elements. Number one, you need to analyze a patient's home or work or living environment. You got to be sure that they're not currently being exposed to toxin. If they are, they won't get well. They've got to either move or have it remediated. Number two, you need to use the right binders Number three, you need to use antifungal materials. And if you do, uh, that's a pretty straightforward way of getting the mold out. So, sorry, Kiki, I'm not sure it's that complicated. <laughs> well, that's good. That fills me with, with a lot of confidence. I'm definitely going to come to you for all my mold issues. But then, so, okay, so once you've gotten the mold out and then you still have this chronic inflammation that you need to reboot all these systems for, you know, these other systems for, So you've talked a little bit about the detoxification system. You've talked a little bit about the nervous system. What about the endocrine system? Because obviously, you know, that especially as a woman, a woman who's approaching menopause, you know, hormones are a big issue for me. And so I find my hormonal balance is really important in terms of my mood, my sleep, how I feel, etc. And so how would you go about, you know, obviously, for instance, does infection with mold or another type of toxin, does that 
calls an adrenal imbalance because your body sees it as a stressor and therefore maybe emits too much cortisol. Is that a possibility which you then have to address? It, it's, it's not just a possibility. It happens almost all the time. But it's not just stress. There's a direct inflammatory effect of mold toxin on the pituitary gland, which is the master gland that controls all of our hormones. So it's the rule rather than the exception that there will be hormonal imbalance. And because the levels of toxin in the body fluctuate so wildly in the body, it's not like a steady amount. Um, the hormonal imbalance is fluctuating also. So when you're treating it while someone is in the throes of having mold toxicity, we're hitting a moving target. However, we can still work within that to make it better. So mold toxicity will trigger adrenal Im imbalances, thyroid imbalances, sex hormone imbalances, pretty much across the board. Now, in the adrenal, there are three main kinds of adrenal hormone. You've got DHEA, which is the main hormone made by the adrenal gland and primarily has to do with energy. So if you've got chronic fatigue, it's very likely your DHEA is low. Then you've got cortisol, which is the stress hormone of the body. And then there's what's called the mineralocorticoids, which are the ones that regulate blood pressure. So it's extremely common for patients to have adrenal issues to describe being lightheaded when they sit up or stand up too quickly because their blood pressure is low. Yeah. And when you have low blood pressure, that's like having low water pressure in your home and turn on the shower and you get a trickle. Well, that's what you've got. So when it comes to looking at the adrenal, we want to look at all three hormone systems because all three are treated differently. Right. Then we have the thyroid in which we can look at a comprehensive look at the thyroid gland. In this area, I want to comment to listeners that many physicians only measure the regulator of thyroid hormone called TSH, and they don't really look at the thyroid hormones directly. So if you're going to look at thyroid, you want to look at not only thyroid stimulating hormone, which is what TSH is, again, made by the pituitary, again, out of balance, but also the two thyroid hormones, which are T3 and T4, and another thyroid product called reverse T3, which messes with all of the above. And again, many physicians don't measure those and therefore are not aware that the thyroid is really fighting itself and really having trouble functioning. And then we have sex hormones, um, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone across the board for men and women. And often that needs to be treated by looking at bioidentical hormones, measuring them. And if they're out of whack, which they often are, then providing some degree of supplementation until we get this reboot accomplished. I mean, this is fascinating because essentially, you know, you can, uh, I, I know, for instance, if I have low progesterone, it will increase my anxiety because progesterone mediates the GABA neurotransmitter, which is the calming neurotransmitter. If I have low estrogen, I can get a bit more depressed because estrogen, you know, regulates the serotonin neurotransmitter. But never would it occur to me, I would think, okay, well, you know, I have low sex hormones at the moment for whatever reason due to chronic, chronic stress, but it wouldn't occur to me that something like mold could actually be a root cause downstream of these hormonal imbalances. Yeah. And I mean, that's just fascinating. And what about Lyme and other co-infections? What, what sort of effect do they have, if any, on your endocrine system? Is it similar uh, to mold? Very. Same exact thing. They inflame the pituitary and they cause the same type of hormonal dysregulation. So, again, yeah, so yes. And then what about the gut? I mean, I know that you talk about a gastrointestinal reboot and a lot of literature and a lot of, uh, you know, it's becoming more common knowledge that there's a huge link between your gut and your brain, you know, mediated essentially a lot by the vagus nerve. But what... How would you describe, you know, this reboot of the gut? How would you go about that? And what are the effects directly or indirectly of mold and other toxins and other infections on the gut 
that then causes it to need this sort of rebooting. Okay, so there are direct effects on the gut. It profoundly messes with the biome of the gut, the very delicate balance between all of the good bacteria that are supposed to be in the gut. When the good bacteria get overwhelmed by mold, candida, fungal parasites sometimes, or an overgrowth of toxic bacterial strains, it really interferes with the way the gut functions. And as you correctly point out, the gut has some major roles here. We often call the gut the little brain because we actually make more serotonin and dopamine in the gut than we actually make in the brain. It's also, we have what is called the GALT, the gut-associated lymphoid tissue, in which a major component of our immune system surrounds our gut, which is logical because it's in direct contact with the outside world. So getting gut to function is a key player here. Now, one of the things that I find in even functional medicine is that Physicians who practice functional medicine are taught that you've got to fix the gut first or you're going to have trouble fixing anything else. Yes. Now, that's true. And I'm going to give but. If you don't get the mold and candida out of there first, you won't be able to fix the gut by the usual mechanisms. So the usual way that we work with the gut is we use probiotics of various sorts. We work with food allergy, being sure that there isn't something the body can't handle, gluten and dairy being the two most common of those and often unrecognized. We often need to get the proper amount of enzymes in the, in the, in the gut, where often once the function is off, we need to supplement that until we can reboot it. But if there is an imbalance in the microbiome, which we can measure, there's a bunch of tests we can do that can tell us what kind of an imbalance we have, we've got to get it right or that potty's going to have a lot of trouble functioning. Completely. And again, this is tied up with the vagus nerve because the vagus nerve controls intestinal motility so that if the vagus nerve is not working properly, then that gut is prone to constipation, so we're holding all of the toxic products of digestion in the GI tract longer, absorbing some of those toxins, making us sicker. So we've got to get that gut working properly. That's absolutely fascinating. And, you know, I mean, the gut, uh, I've, I've also read that the vagus nerve is very linked to the actual microbiome. And so, you know, it actually interacts with the good and the bad bacteria in, in a very uh, sort of symbiotic way. The other thing I'm interested in is candida. A lot of people are sort of obsessed with candida, which is a type of fungus which grows in the gut and uh, what is the link between candida and mold? I mean, is there a correlation between the two? Like if you have mold poisoning, will it increase your chances of getting candida? And one of the interesting things also about candida, in my understanding, is that it can create leaky gut because it sort of grows into the tight junctions of your gut and colonizes it and, and uh, creates leaky gut which then allows inflammatory substances, so larger molecules, to go through the gut lining and to cause inflammation in the system and eventually neuroinflammation. So what is the link between candida and, say, infections and, and toxins like mold, if any? Oh, very much any. Um, <laughs> the, your explanation is correct, but I want to add to that the effect of the toxins that mold make on the leaky junction directly, not merely growing into them, but merely toxic. So a large percentage of our patients with mold and candida have irritable bowel, alternating diarrhea or constipation. One of them may predominate. Gas is extremely common because candida and mold ferment carbohydrate turning it into gas, which can cause reflux and abdominal pain. So virtually every symptom in the abdomen can be related to the direct effect of mold. And by the way, Bartonella can do that as well. So can mold do that? Absolutely can do that. Candida and mold are kissing cousins. They're 
very, very closely related anatomically. They both love carbohydrates. Um, if you remember the old feed me Seymour, um, the imperative that some people have to eat sweets or carbohydrate may be a misinterpretation of what's going on in the body, which is there's a kind of a hive mentality for candida. And basically, it is trying to tell you to feed it the way it wants to. So I don't know about you or your listeners, but when I think about Neil, I don't think about Neil as it's not Neil and the 70 trillion bacteria that live inside him. For me, that's that's not me. That's something internal to me. It's not really part of me. But in truth, it is. I have 70 trillion bacteria living in my gut. And if I have a significant amount of candida in there, they can be sending biochemically, they can send the message feed me carbohydrates. So one of the classical symptoms of candida is to do just that. Now, I think I hear that message and go, oh, I want carbohydrates. I'm not thinking, oh, it's the candida that want carbohydrates. So we, we can be profoundly influenced, and we're just beginning to learn to what extent. We can be profoundly influenced by the consciousness, if you will, of these microbes. Well, it's a symbiotic relationship, essentially. I mean, they're sort of parasites, not not literally, but I mean, in some sense, they're feeding off us, and we have a symbiotic relationship with them. And I think one of the key lessons, presumably, and I think you mentioned this in your book, is, you know, to, to be very careful to go on a low-carbohydrate diet um, to sort of starve the mold and the candida and the fungus, and that what works best usually is a high-protein, low-carbohydrate diet in terms of helping reduce the inflammation caused by these toxins and, and fungi, etc. Is that, would you, that's correct, right? Uh, that is correct, but I basically look at it as just don't feed them. Right, Meaning, starve them. I mean, yeah, basically. I, I, let me come back to your term symbiotic. We have a symbiotic relationship to the bacteria in our gut. They do a lot of things for us and we really need them. I'm not sure we're symbiotic with molds or with parasites. Yeah, both of them both of them are not really generally our friends. I can't think of much that they do for us. Yeah. Now, and keep in mind that once established, they love us. We are the hosts or the hostesses with the mostesses. It's a perfect environment in there. It's moist, dark, warm perfect temperature and tons of nutrients why would they leave and how how would you say just in a nutshell that candida or that type of fungus would impact our mental health so you know is it because of the fact that they cause leaky gut which then can cause neuroinflammation especially with these lps right. uh, bacteria or what would you say is the mechanism so yes they do that and they make endotoxins, which further affect it. Endotoxins can go directly through the blood-brain barrier to the brain. Okay, And they make gliotoxin. Now, molds make other toxins, but candida makes gliotoxin, which specifically has this inflammatory effect upon the brain, causing all of these things that we've been talking about in terms of mental health symptoms. Right. So... Candida can directly impact it. It doesn't always. And you know, I've been treating candida for, gosh, 40 years. I probably treated 10,000 cases of candida in my career. In the earlier days, and I'm just reflecting on it now, I don't remember candida affecting the brain the way it does now. Typically, when people had candida, it was affected, it was primarily it was vaginal, causing a vaginitis, or it was gut-related. And if you treated it with fairly simple things back in those days, you could use a variety of herbs, uh, caprylic acid, garlic, berberine, oh, undicelic right. acid. Yeah. A any number of things would easily get rid of candida without requiring antifungal medication. Over the years... 
we've watched it become more toxic and harder to eradicate. So it's the more toxic thing that I'm reflecting on as I'm talking with you right now is I'm realizing that, God, for the first 20 years that I treated it, I almost never associated it with a mental health issue. But increasingly, I do see that now. And I'm wondering if that reflects back on our earlier part of our conversation of something is making these candida species more toxic to us. They're releasing more toxin, perhaps, than they used to. I'm not aware that anybody has studied that, but we're definitely seeing that clinically. Or could it be our environment, which are more toxic? For instance, we eat more processed food, more carbohydrates, more sugar. We have more antibiotics and NSAIDs. Maybe the, the host is weaker, which allows the candida to have more of a detrimental effect. I don't know. It's interesting. And so, yes, the host is weaker. I don't have any question about that. And now we get into toxic load which is that we can handle small amounts of toxin often. Our, our body is designed to process it and eliminate it. We have excellent organs of elimination. But as our toxic load has increased, I commented on the massive influx of chemicals in our environment that we didn't have before. Heavy metal toxicity is greater. So eventually our toxic load builds up to the point that's, that – one of those toxins might not have bothered us in the past, but the cumulative load now becomes a burden that we don't know how to deal with. Absolutely. And then talk me through, and obviously we should probably wrap up soon because you've been so kind with your time. You've been amazing. And this is fascinating. Could go on for hours, but I'm interested in neurotransmitters because, you know, traditionally, as you know, if you're depressed or you're anxious, a lot of the time you get prescribed an SSRI, so a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, which essentially aims to increase the amount of serotonin sort of between your synapses. What is the impact of, you know, and that's just treating the symptoms rather than the causes, but what is the impact of mold and other toxins and infection on our neurotransmitters generally, whether it's serotonin or dopamine or GABA? Is there, you know, how, if any, is there that sort of relationship where we can say, okay, well, instead of giving someone an SSRI, let's look at how these root causes are impacting the various neurotransmitters which are determining our moods, our levels of anxiety, our levels of motivation, our cognition, etc. It isn't just about neurotransmitters. Neurotransmitters are just chemicals, and they need receptors to glom onto. Yeah. And those receptors have to be embedded into a cell uh, membrane that is capable of processing it. So if you have a cell membrane that is loaded with toxin molecules that it, it, they literally can't get through, or the inflammation that is affecting the cell membrane is affecting the gated channels that allow information and other materials to diffuse through there. So I, I think it's a tad more complicated than affecting the levels of neurotransmitters. I, I suspect that it's more related to how those neurotransmitters are utilized by the body and how they function. And we do see that. For example, I, I know that there are some people who are big on measuring neurotransmitters in the blood or urine. And I've not found them very helpful because I don't think that they reflect the levels of neurotransmitter in the brain. And as we talked about previously, I don't think it tells us what's going on in every area of the brain. So I think it's a naive strategy to go, ah, you're low in norepinephrine. I will give you these things and we will fix that. Uh, I, I think we have to take a step back and get a lot more sophisticated about looking at the entire way in which the body generates information through the neurotransmitters and how they affect the nervous system. Uh, am I being clear? Absolutely, absolutely. And I mean, what strikes me is, you know, essentially, you have to look at all the systems that are linked to the neurotransmitters, such as the gut system, the endocrine system, 
you know, the nervous system, all these systems that actually support the creation of these neurotransmitters. And that's where we get back to your reboot um, idea of rebooting these systems so that they function correctly, so that then a natural uh, consequence of that would be healthier neurotransmitters, which are more able to communicate um, and do their job, essentially. So I think... I'm trying to think if I've covered most of this or if there's anything that, I mean, your book talks about so many other things, which we unfortunately don't have, you can't, can't cover here because it's just too long, but it talks about methylation, psyche, you know, rebooting the stress response, the spiritual aspects, it talks a lot about the immune system, and it's just absolutely brilliant. So all I can do is just really recommend your book very very highly and and you know but i think the main point of this podcast is really to show in this conversation with you is to show that mental health symptoms can be so much more um than what we you know in mainstream medicine seem to treat them as as sort of an insufficiency in serotonin or you know a necessity to talk about one's childhood and you know, with a therapist. And I think you've really shown this and you've shown the fact that, you know, it's it's quite complex and that the levels of toxins and infectious agents in our environment have grown exponentially whilst our sort of our our physiology has weakened over the years being exposed to all these different toxins and processed foods and and, you know, antibiotics and NSAIDs, etc. And so I think the main message to the listeners is, you know, let's look beyond, you know, let's look for the root cause and of mental issues, mental health issues, and um, especially mold, other toxins, Lyme, Bartonella, other infections. And I think you've been absolutely brilliant in, in describing, you know, the, the sort of an overview of the pathways that can lead to these mental health issues from these root causes. Is there anything else that you want to sort of close with for our listeners? Or, I mean, you've been incredibly comprehensive already, but a final message. <laughs> well, I just want to, my prayers and blessings go to all of you to stay safe from COVID-19 and uh, that when we all come out on the other end, then we'll get our lives together. I would urge all listeners to learn more about what we're doing to our environment. We've run out of time to fix it. I suspect that we'll be seeing other things that will be in the category of plague coming down the pike. Mm -hmm. We've done a terrible job of taking care of Mother Nature, and I think Mother Nature will take care of itself. Um, and we're seeing this is the tip of the iceberg when it comes to that. So to all listeners, even if you're not prone to being politically motivated, please learn more about what we are doing to our environment. And please talk to your legislators about really taking an active role in demanding that the planet that our children and grandchildren are going to inherit will be a safe place to live. Because if we're going at the rate we are, it's not going to be. I don't, I don't want to be a downer here, but this is imperative that all of us as residents of this planet, that we take that responsibility seriously. A hundred percent. Thank you so much. And I couldn't agree more. And I think at this, at this time, we're very aware of how fragile we are. And we've taken for granted this unprecedented period of sort of peace and prosperity and in some ways health. And that's now gone. And it's not a bad thing because we needed to have a consciousness raising event, which I think this COVID-19 has been, that we need to take better care of the environment and of our health. It can, it can be. If we take it as a wake-up call or a slap in the face and, and take that seriously, then God bless us, I think that would be the way we need to take this information. If we then take a deep breath and continue to go back to doing what we did, I think that would be a mistake. I totally agree. Well, thank you so yeah. much, Dr. Neil Nathan, your Mr. 
you you know everything about the toxins that we're spewing out into this world and into our own physiology and the effects that it has. And so we're incredibly grateful to have you on our podcast and thank you so much for your time. You're very welcome, Kiki. Thanks for having me. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to the Mind Health 360 show. I hope that we've helped you realize that your mental health symptoms have root causes that can and need to be addressed in order to sustainably heal and have given you some ideas about steps you may take to start your healing journey. Please share this interview with anyone you think may find it helpful. And if you want further information, please go to www.mindhealth360.com or check us out on social media. This information is for educational purposes only and is not intended to diagnose or treat any disease or to replace medical advice. Please always consult your healthcare practitioner before discontinuing any medication or implementing any changes in your diet, lifestyle, or supplement program. Thank you.